con la doctora Carol Tenapira, en nombre de la Escuela Graduada de Ciencia y Tecnología de Información del recinto de Río Piedra, le damos la bienvenida a todos y a todas las personas que están con nosotros aquí. Y a los que están viendo a través de Ustream la presentación igualmente. Eh, algo que en, en el día de ayer olvidé decirles, no sé, algunos de ustedes, los que no sean... Eh, no, no hicieron registro a través de Eventbrite, eh, deben enviarnos eh, alguna comunicación de manera que podamos enviarle la presentación, porque nosotros la subimos y se la enviamos a todos los que estaban ya matriculados a través de este sistema. Deben haberla recibido y, y para que ustedes mismos, si decidían imprimirla, la imprimieran y si decidían verla electrónicamente, lo hicieran de esa manera también y así nos ahorramos un poquito de papel. Además de eso, eh, aquellos de ustedes que lo, lo necesiten, vamos a enviar también unos certificados de participación eh, utilizando este mismo sistema. Así que por favor, los que no participaron de la... los que no se re, hicieron registro con Eventbrite, nos dejan sus direcciones electrónicas para podérselo hacer llegar. Bien, ahora sí, podemos empezar. La Bien, para nosotros es, eh, para aquellos que no estaban ayer, eh, quisiera decir unas palabras sobre nuestra conferenciante, la doctora Carol Teo Pires, una eh, profesora destacada de la Universidad, del Programa de Ciencia de Información de la Universidad de Tennessee en Knoxville, eh, programa con el cual nuestra escuela tiene un acuerdo de colaboración eh, y como parte de ese acuerdo es que la hemos invitado y está aquí con nosotros. El, ayer eh, habló sobre el proyecto de Lean Value, un eh, proyecto eh, sumamente interesante y valioso eh, para determinar no solamente cuánto valor se, se puede identificar que las bibliotecas académicas aportan a las instituciones de educación superior, sino que nos permiten además mirar eh, nuestra propia práctica y nuestra propia ejecutoria. En, en distintas dimensiones utilizando una diversidad de metodologías y enfocándonos realmente en, en lo que debe ser importante para los procesos bibliotecarios. Eh, hoy tenemos la, la ventaja de contar también con su experiencia y con su conocimiento en el área de la investigación, en el área de desarrollo de propuestas de investigación y algo que todos literalmente siempre nos falta, que son los recursos financieros para llevar a cabo la, la investigación. Eh, yo entiendo que los dos recursos más importantes y más escasos siempre son el tiempo y el dinero para hacer las cosas. Las ideas sobran, eh, los deseos sobran. El problema es que no tenemos usualmente ni el tiempo ni, la, ni los recursos para hacerlo. Eh, pues como les mencionaba, la, la profesora tiene eh, un sinnúmero de publicaciones, ha sido una eh, muy prolífica autora eh, de artículos tanto desde en bibliotecología como en procesos de investigación. Tenemos también la, la ventaja de que ella, les dando los correos electrónicos, ayer me manifestó y me lo reiteró que podían enviarle eh, preguntas relacionadas con, con lo que ella presente aquí hoy, con lo que presentó ayer eh, y ella con mucho gusto o las contesta o las refiere a alguien que pueda eh, ayudarle. Así que eh, sin más voy a dejarlos con ustedes con, con la doctora Tenopir. Voy a cambiar de canal ahora para que ella sepa qué es lo que estoy haciendo. Now in English. <laughs> Now I just wanted to uh, welcome you again, Dr. Tenopir, uh, and, and again express our thanks and uh, of, uh, for the possibility of having you visit with us and having you share your knowledge and experience uh, yesterday about the Lean Value project and today about information, about the research in library and information science, uh, as important as it is in, in all uh, areas of our, uh, of our work both faculty and librarians will need to work together in this, in this process. And so uh, we welcome you and we know that's going to be a very fruitful interchange. 
please. Thank you again, and welcome back to some of you. I see a lot of familiar faces from yesterday, and thanks for returning, and, and, and welcome for the first time for those of you who are just here today. Um, totally different topic today, although yesterday I talked about a research grant, a three-year project, actually three-year-plus project um, funded by the um, Institute of Museum and Library Services. So that's an example of some of the things I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to focus on, on um, writing grant proposals and, and some tips and, and uh, and how to write successful grant proposals from my personal perspective as well as a more generic perspective. For, um, for the last 11 years, I was director of research for the College of Communication and Information at University of Tennessee and director of our Center for Information and Communication Studies. And one of the things that I did in that job was to help other people write grant proposals and try to improve our success rate of grant proposals. And I will say many times today that um, it is very unusual to write a proposal, your first proposal, and get funded for that proposal the first, first time. So that will not be the only time I will say that today. It is a process, and it's a process of improving and resubmitting and, and retuning. So it's a commitment. Um, and it's something, as I say, that I was working with our faculty across the college to, um, to encourage them to start that process and then to make and to try to encourage them to keep up with it. Um, when you get a, um, the worst thing that happens is if you don't get funded the first time and you get discouraged and never do it again. And so trying to convince people that it is worth it in the long run, it was a large part of what I did. So um, I'll just say that up front uh, today. The, um, the other thing I want to mention in, as prologue is that you never stop learning about how to write good proposals. So take advantage of anything that, that you can um, your, uh, at your institutions, your offices of research may have um, short-term courses or they may have, uh, they may have materials online that, you, that help improve for certain agencies how to write a good NSF proposal or something, so look to see what's available on your campuses. Um, also, the certain uh, different agencies have um, webinars and short workshops and things. Um, IMLS, for example, often has webinars to, to give people um, ideas of what will be successful for a particular solicitation, so do take advantage of those. And, and I still attend those whenever I can because um, Things change, but also um, there is, you, can, you can always get better at it. So I, I will say that. And one other, one other um, preliminary is that um, today uh, there is. Um, I've just finished an e-booklet on uh, for those of you who are librarians on librarians can do research too. I think is the is the final name of it. It is it is um, uh, sponsored. It's it's free and open access, um, sponsored by Elsevier Library Connect. If you know their newsletter, they have a Library Connect series, and this is part of their Library Connect series. And, and so look for that, um, look for that e-booklet, and we're gonna be doing a webinar on that e-booklet in mid-April. So I just got this news this morning that it was coming out today, so I don't have a slide for you, but, um, but I'll pass that on then so that you can uh, find out about that. Again, it's about it's directed at, at um, working librarians and, and some of the reasons for doing research and, um, and some of the um, opportunities for research. Um, but anyway, today um, we're going to work on some of those same kind of concepts, but for, from a broader perspective. Some of you are researchers. In, in the LIS program, some of you are librarians, um, so it's some of you are students. So we're going to look at um, grants and grant proposals in the library and information science field, kind of in, in general terms. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some, some general comments of what makes a good grant proposal, a good grant idea in, in LIS. 
so look at specifically some sources of funding for ah lis projects, but there are lots. and so um i can't cover everything, but i'll focus um on on some that that i have some knowledge of and and some perspective on ah particularly on um two federal agencies and two foundations that i have current grants with um and then some tips on proposal writing and we'll work together on improving some proposal writing and then as i did yesterday as time permits we'll have you get to work to to on on proposal writing or starting that process of thinking of ideas and how how you might words you might use to um to improve your proposal writing so that's that's our plan for today and we have until um 11 o'clock so we should have time for not only um, my remarks, questions, if you have them, and, and time for you to work. So um, to, start, to start with some of the general comments about writing grant proposals. So um, lots of different reasons for writing grant proposals. And, and if you have done them before, you, you probably know these. Some of you have just getting started in the process. One of the things I had to do all the time for our, um, for our faculty and in communication information was say they would say to me i do research i do teaching i don't have time to write grant proposals and why should i anyway i can do what i need to do uh within my budget and so so this idea of why why should you bother um and and one of the one of the reasons to why should you bother is sometimes there is a special project that you really can't do without uh, additional funding or with, without collaborators or people with other expertise so um for example um a project that uh, was involved with a, a couple years ago was digitizing some historic newspapers the library uh, I, I was involved with um, with some of the educational and assessment parts of that. The library was the, at the University of Tennessee was the main um, principal investigator there. They had a lot of historic newspapers that uh, they had in, in paper and they were preserving. They didn't have the the staff um, or the priority or the expertise to do a wide scale digitization. Um, and what they wanted to do also was to go beyond just the digitization. They wanted to then help um, secondary school teachers with educational plans for how they might use the historic materials. So it was newspapers, it was also other kinds of historic materials from the, from the beginning of, um, of the state of Tennessee in the, er, in the um, 1700s. So historical materials, historical newspapers, it was wonderful stuff, but they just didn't have, it didn't fit the priority. So the idea of getting a grant that included educators, that included assessors, and then included a digitizing team, helped them do that special project, which otherwise they would not have been able to do. So it's something maybe you've always wanted to do, but it seems like it's a little bit side to your mission. It fits within, but it's, it's more than you can take. And so a grant uh, proposal, the funding and the impetus um, of, of bringing teams together can really help you do a special, a, a special project. It was a, it's a one-time project, but once it's done, the, then the, um, uh, the maintenance of it is, is, a, is a lot less. So. Another reason to do um, a grant proposal is to form collaborations that you have not, uh, that you maybe have wanted to do, but you, you have done informally, but you want to make it more formal. Um, most agencies today look with favor on collaborations. Collaborative proposals, multi-institutional proposals are looked on very favorably by the large funders. The idea of, of um, bringing together partnerships that um, you know each other but you really haven't done a formal partnership is looked on very favorably by funding agencies and it gives you a chance to work with your colleagues your friends in a in a formal way and to build new partnerships um, again an example of that we are at university of tennessee we're right next door to the oak ridge national laboratory and a, a national research laboratory um, funded by the department of energy and we have we do things with them, but we wanted to do uh, we want to kind of take that to the next level. So grants are one way they are they are um, driven by by grant funds. Their staff works only when they're funded. So 
doing a collaboration with them was a way for us to begin to build relationships so that we could look for opportunities for our students for practicum opportunities for example to provide a place for for graduating students to get jobs would build those relationships and the grant proposal working on grant proposals together and grant projects allowed us to do that we work together on an NSF a large NSF funded project called data one which is data it's building a data infrastructure and research data services for environmental science data and so they're a part of it we're a part of it lots of other people University of California is a part of it it's headed out of the University of New Mexico it's allowed us to build partnerships wide widely spoke across the country but really part of the impetus was starting that relationship kind of close to home but allowing us to work together so grant proposals are a really good way to build those those uh, ongoing relationships another reason to write a grant proposal is to to become a leader in an area an area that is unique to you or you have a strength in or you want to build a strength in and it allows you to get visibility because of one of the things when you do a grant of course they want you to disseminate your results it's not just doing it for your own institution they want everybody to learn from what you've done so they expect you to build in conference attendance to talk about your project to build in a dissemination plan so you build a website that, that uh, has information from your project they expect you to perhaps to publish your results so this idea that it is a widespread kind of thing that builds your expertise in an area um, again a personal example um, we uh, because of this growing relationship and we've been working now six years on the data one project um, close relationship with Oak Ridge National Lab we thought a natural for our school is science information so, so that's something that fits within our area. We really wanted to build that expertise in data science and science information. And so we have been able to build on um, projects to become a leader in science information. So IMLS has funded us on project Science Links, which was bringing students who had um, undergraduate degrees in sciences to get a master's degree in, in information science focusing on serving science libraries and science organizations. Um, they funded another one, which was doctoral students who would then go and teach science information and other information science programs. And we have a project right now called Team Science, where our students are teaming with science organizations across, across the region. So we have students who are working at um, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, the, the Ag Library on our campus, this idea that we can say, well, we, we have this expertise and these partnerships, and, and grants have allowed us to do that. We would be able to offer some courses, but we really wouldn't be able to build the relationships and have the, the leadership in this area without the grant proposals. And you'll notice a theme here that one thing kind of leads to another. So you begin at something, sometimes it's a very small, it might be a planning grant, it might be a small grant, but one thing as you build expertise can lead, can lead to another, another kind of branch out from there. Um, the other is if you, um, if you, especially those of you who in the LIS program, uh, there are grant proposals that help you build curriculum, as I mentioned, our science information curriculum, or support students in a special area. Or if you're writing a proposal, if you're in a library, uh, you know, write in a student assistant, write in a research assistant position for somebody who's just graduated. It's uh, uh, most um, uh, most agencies are supportive of that. It allows you to uh, help uh, the educational process as well as provide students and, and recent graduates with very good. Uh, good kind of expertise. So they are they are helping you. They're focusing on something. It helps. Um, if, again, if you're in an LIS program, it helps you build curriculum. If you're in a library, um, you can also um, work on grant proposals to build curriculum within your um, within the goals of your particular institution. So right now we are collaborating with the um, with our College of Engineering. 
who um, realizes because uh, their main funding agencies like National Science Foundation now requires that their um, that the people who get grants, a lot of the engineers who get grants, have to have a data management plan, have to deposit their data, and they don't know what to do with it. So they brought us in as collaborators to help build their curriculum in data management, which fits in very well with. And you don't, you know, it doesn't have to be an LIS program. That, that it could be with part of the library you know, collaborating with the engineering department. So look for good collaborations. It doesn't, the, the library doesn't always have to be the leader. The library can be uh, um, partnering with, um, with another department um, on, on campus for things that help research support or, or fit within your mission and their mission. Um, I a cautionary note here. <laughs> um, you will not get funded if you write a proposal that says I don't have enough money to do this and I really want to do it, even though it may be in the back of your mind, right? Um, so it's not it's not enough reason, and it's not enough reason for a couple things. One is it doesn't sell to an agency. They can they know immediately if you're not passionate about the idea, if you're just looking for funds. It's it's uh, it's amazing how you know the readers can tell that. So that's part of it. The other is you've got to do it. If you get the grant, you have to have the will and the passion and the motivation to actually do the work. And if if you're Pure motivation is I want to get more money for the library. Then you, you're, you know, you're going to say, Oh my gosh, now you're going to do it. You know, I don't want. So, so um, yes, it does help you get funds, but don't make that the only only motivation because uh, I, you, you probably wouldn't get the funds, but then you might regret it if you do. Um, but now, having said that, said budget is not sufficient. You are asking someone. And there are people, there are agencies, but there are people who are making that decision. You're asking them to give you their money, in a sense. It's not their personal money. But you're asking the National Science Foundation, or the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or the Mellon Foundation, or the Gates Foundation. You're asking the individuals there who make the decisions and their peer review panels to choose you to, to give their their limited resources to. So, um, so again, you you have to not only have passion for your idea and what you're doing, you have to convince them that this is a great idea, that there's a problem that needs to be resolved. The problem, you know, engineers have to ha deposit their data and they have to have data management plans, that there is a solution the solution is perhaps better education. The solution is building. Um, the University of California built a data management planning tool, maybe building a tool and offering, uh, partnering with information science programs or their solution, and that you are the best one to do that. So it really is. You have to convince them. The grant proposal um, really has to be something that is is um, a good idea sold very well. So you have to, you're, you're asking for their money. So there's certain things that a grant proposal has to include. It has to fit within their priorities. They really don't like to get proposals that don't match their priorities. So um, the first thing you've got to do is you've really got to get on their websites and see the kinds of things they have funded in the past and what they're asking for now. Sometimes things change. And, and those of you who have experience with IMLS, know that in the last year or two, things have changed a little bit. <laughs> but for National Science Foundation, generally read, you know, that they support all fields of fundamental science and engineering except medical sciences. So if you have a science, a medical information query, do not go to NSF. They are not allowed to fund mm -hmm. medical uh, research, and that includes medical information. That has to go to uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, so there is a separation there. You cannot you cannot send medical ideas. And and when I say medical ideas, let's face it, information and library science go with everything and anything. There is an information component to most projects. 
whether it's a small piece, helping them with their data management planning, or whether it's the whole project, building an um, information system that, that helps answer the queries. So there, there is a, you know, there's either a small piece or a big piece in, in lots of these things. But don't send medical ideas to NSF. They reject them offhand. They don't even go to the peer review. The other thing for NSF that I should point out is all fields of fundamental science and engineering includes social sciences. And most people don't realize that NSF's field, nine fields of science, includes social science. So it's basically everything except humanities and except medicine. So NSF, don't, don't think, if you don't do science, don't think NSF, okay, that's all, uh, because you, you all do social science. If you're looking at behavior, how do you, how do you help people understand an information source? That's behavior. How have students' information seeking changed um, with technology? That's an NSF uh, program area. That, that, that fits in. So it includes social science, includes computer science, which they often include information science with computer science. It's not just hardware and software. It may be developing systems or understanding how people interact with systems, which is what we do all the time. So, so, so NSF is, again, includes social science, but it, dis it excludes medical science. IMLS is one that you probably have thought of. Um, that one is, is definitely, I mean, that one's reserved for our, our, our fields, museums uh, included, museums and libraries. Um, and of course, their, their overall statement is they support libraries and museums. But, but look at their, their mission a little bit more. Their, their priorities are promotion of public access to knowledge, cultural heritage, and lifelong learning. So you need to tie your idea into these things. It's not enough to say, um, you know, I'm going to make, make my um, university library better. Um, you need to say, you know, how does that help public access to knowledge? How is it? Well, they're looking at the big picture. Both of these agencies, these are both federal agencies, and they answer to Congress. And the first question Congress says when they're deciding what their budget is, how are these, how is the work that these people do help Americans? That's what they're concerned about. How does it help people? How is it brought? How does it help, um, in the case of IMLS, public access to knowledge, public access to cultural heritage, and lifelong learning? So we were yesterday, I had a wonderful tour yesterday of the, um, of the um, Munoz Martin archives. And they have an IMLS grant under the museum services to help preserve the cultural objects of Puerto Rico. And they have built you know, they've helped them build, so they can help you, you know, build uh, uh, facilities and climate control as well as metadata creation and all of these things, but because it helps um, promote cultural heritage. And so, so that's something that fits within. So um, you just need to make sure that it's, it's something that kind of fits within what they're looking at. Um, NSF is a little broader. I mean, it's supports all fields in any way you can build the case. Um, they, grant ideas and proposals need to be unique, something they haven't seen before, really compelling, and or important. It can be, it, you know, if it's all three, it's great. Um, it can be something that's not unique that others have done, but it's really important and hasn't been completely resolved, or it hasn't been completely resolved in your area or your subject your subject area or your geographic area. So it doesn't have to be the first time they've seen it. It can be building on something else. Um, but it needs to be at least one of one of these. Um, the kinds of words that NSF uses, and by the way, it's always good practice to echo back the words <laughs> they use. Um, they're looking for those words. And they use those words in their solicitations and in their mission statements for a reason. They want to know that you've read it. So they use words like transformative. What you're doing is going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference to your students, and it's going to be something that perhaps 
um, you you will disseminate your ideas so it can make a difference to other students who are similar to your students. So not just at your institution, but for but will transform the way something is done. Um, they're looking for high risk, high payoff ideas. Uh, they don't want you to be conservative in your ideas. So um, you know, with NSF, you can kind of go for it. Uh, they want something creative, something that people say, "Wow, if this works, it would be really exciting." So some of the early work on wearable computing, for example, uh, was done uh, with NSF dollars. Some of these things, you know, they thought, "Okay, if this were wow, that's going to change the way things are done." So nowadays, if you propose um, a study, um, which we did, and it wasn't funded, to look at how um, engineers in the field use information sources on their handheld devices, and how does that change the way they interact? That was that was last year. <laughs> that was so old, you know, the idea. In other words, that was something that was not, they figured, okay, that's the time for that's past, that's already being done. So we need to think of something new, and I, you know, I don't know, we didn't follow up on that, but would it be, you know, the way engineers, if the engineers are wearing bio suits or something that have, I, I don't know. But, you know, what, what is it that's the next, that's coming next that will move things forward? Um, uh, how do students, um, there has been some work funded recently of how um, students understand things differently reading from, from a handheld device versus reading from print. There's been a lot of interesting work on that. Some of that funded by National Science Foundation. Now a lot's been funded on that, so how do you take it to the next level? You know, what is it? Uh, maybe tying it to student learning or tying it to um, English as a second language learning or something. There needs to be, you know, something that kind of takes it they like um, good collaborations. Find partners that you may not think of working with. They love public-private partnerships. If you are a university, they like you partnering with a corporation. So think about collaborations that you may not have thought of before. They like to have, you know, kind of unique collaborations working with an organization that maybe is providing you with unique hardware or, you know, things to test or, or um, you know, some kind of, of software or something, but they like that kind of collaboration. And, and a lot of corporations like to, like to uh, have these collaborations too because it's usually, you know, there is funding both, both ways as well as the, the ability to try things out. They may have new things that they want to try out in a university setting that, uh, that could work out well. And then finally, I didn't realize this. I was you know, digging through NSF. It's good for me to have prepared for this because I had came across this statement that I did not, had missed before. Projects that may seem like science fiction today, but which the public will take for granted tomorrow. And that's why the handheld thing, they said, eh, you know, that's, that's not science fiction anymore. That's, that's reality. Take us to the next level. And, and um, you know, I don't know. Sometimes that's a little scary. Maybe, you know, wearable maybe is, I don't know. I, some of these things you don't even want to think about. You know, implants, I don't know. Don't, you, I'll let you think about that. But something, again, they're looking for something that will wow them. Um, the other thing that a lot of funding agencies are looking for is they're looking for reach. They want something that either as an example, an exemplar, or the project itself will reach many people. So again, it's not enough to say, I'm just gonna do this at my university. I mean, you can, you can use your university as a way to test something out, but then you need to say it will be generalizable. It will work for other, there are X number of other universities that have the kind of profile a student I have, and, and it will help them, we'll make it available, we'll make our results available to them, or we'll make the tool we develop available to them. So, so there are ways of this idea that, that having a broad, broad reach. So um, from IMLS, they, they say they want museums and libraries as strong community anchors, and they're looking for civic engagement, cultural opportunities, economic vitality. So the idea that by, by um, funding the, um, the archives, um, collection, helping preserve these items, it will, it will, um, we will also do a promotion 
of this collection and we will bring student groups in to let them and do sessions for them and we will you know we'll will um, increase the number of people that have access now and into the future and it will help us um, help teachers uh, do class materials about the materials we have in our archives those kinds of things looking for beyond just the group you're looking at how will this go into the future and reach a bigger a bigger audience uh, it may be something that you're developing for your current group of, of students and you're talking about carrying this forward for every group and you're, um, you're, you're improving um, the way they're learning, um, improving their, their uh, opportunity for success. Um, Mellon Foundation, which I've just started a new project of Mellon Foundation, um, they, they are one that, that, that does specifically uh, focus on humanities and the arts. So if you have an idea that's a humanities or arts or scholarly communication in general, um, they, are, they are a particularly good funder for that. Um, I like the words that they use, promote and defend the contributions of humanities and the arts, which is kind of interesting. So they have an advocacy role. They want you to be an advocate for contributions of humanities. So you know, building a case that humanities are valuable in today's society, that, that fits with what Mellon does. Um, the other thing is that they really do have this advocacy role. Uh, well-being of diverse and democratic societies. So they want you to, you know, they want you, you know, ta-da, they want you to, to actually, you know, work on something that will help move uh, society forward, democracy forward, these kinds of things, and the Mellon Foundation has that in their mission statement, and that's what they're looking for. Now, having said that, not everything has to be at that level. The project we're working on for Mellon is a project um, that's led by the University of California system, and it includes research libraries at um, University of um, British Columbia, so it's a Canadian-US partnership, um, Harvard, Ohio State and, and University of Tennessee. And what it's looking at, it's looking at open access, the cost of open access to research universities. Now that's, you know, that's not exactly, it's hard to say to da about that. That's, that's somewhat mundane. But the, but the idea is it's, they're looking at scholarly communication. And if we switch to an open access author pays model completely, what financial implications does that have for research universities who are, if they're paying for their faculty members to submit? And it also has an implication for humanities. Humanities faculties don't tend to have the grant money uh, that sciences do and what happens then if the library doesn't support subscriptions. So it's, it's, it's not maybe as exciting, but it's important. And it was built on the importance. Uh, you know, if, if, if what does this do to humanities faculty? What does it do to all faculty? What does it do to the institutions in general? And what are the positives and the negatives? And what are the economic implications? So, um, so again, it's, it's uh, you can have a few smaller scale projects within this. I just submitted a grant proposal, I don't know if it's gonna be successful, but to the Carnegie, first time I've ever done things to the Carnegie Foundation. And they actually went a step further than Mellon. They, they I got written in the, the wording. They um, said that uh, it had to contribute to international stability. I whoa, <laughs> um, and, and they, uh, they don't want science ideas. They want social science or humanities kinds of idea. They, they specifically mentioned um, um, looking at religious understanding, for example, and international stability, um, which is not, not the idea that I was doing. But, um, but so sometimes you know, these, these foundations have a real mission and, and what they're looking for. The Gates Foundation, um, in, in the information science part is really um, about equity of access to information technology. That's, that's their, their mission in, in the information area. So each, each foundation has a quite clear mission um, in, in as well as the federal agencies. Oh, let me back up for a minute on um, the stated priorities for IMLS. I forgot to say some of you um, know this about IMLS. But uh, I mentioned things changed this year, 
and now they've started this new process of asking for pre-proposals, um, a couple pages of an idea, and then they invite the ones they like or think have promised to write a full proposal. So this, some agencies of NSF have this, most do not, but IML has just started this. I think that the idea is that if, if it's not going to be funded, if it doesn't fit within their priorities, they'll leave those out early. So it makes it easier for you. You don't have to do the full, the full proposal. But that's, that's different. And so look for that. Their next go-round um, will be uh, their next solicitation, the Laura Bush um, uh, Librarians for the 21st Century, will include that, I think. They've said that they're going to include that in the future. And within that, they have narrowed they have a narrow call each time of, of um, priorities that they're willing to look at for that particular solicitation. Um, and for this last, um, the 2015 National Leadership Grants, which it, the pre-proposals are closed now. So if you have a pre-proposal, you've heard whether you get to do the full proposal or not. Um, but um, this time, it was only two areas. They would only take proposals in a national, building national digital platforms, or improving that, and learning, uh, uh, learning spaces in libraries were the only two areas that they were funding. So that's much narrower than they've been in the past. So, so that's a change, the priority, you gotta check every time. And they do webinars about this to explain it, so be sure to, if you're interested in that, be sure to get, check their site regularly, see what their priorities are, how they're changing. Every time they have a new director, it seems like their priorities change. And, and then um, their process may change too. And, um, but, but do attend the webinars. Okay, um, let's see, where was I, yeah. The, um, the other thing about a, a proposal is that it ha uh, sustainability is something that in the last few years has become more and more important in these solicitations used to be you do the research, you'd be done, and that's it. Um, now there's more focus on projects, and even for research more, especially for IMLS, more focus on sustainability. Yesterday when I was talking about the Live Value project, somebody asked me what was the hardest part about it, and I thought about it, and I said the hardest part was turning it, uh, our sustainability plan was the Association of Research Libraries, ARL, is taking it over. And the hardest part is just trusting that they're going to, you know, I like the people at ARL, but they're going to carry it forward. That was the sustainability plan. This is an organization that said they will continue the work, they'll continue to make uh, materials available. And I haven't had the nerve to check the bibliography to see if they're keeping it up to date. I, you know, I worry about that. I know I'm probably going to have to go home tonight and do it. But, um, but, but so this sustainability is in the sustainability plan is, is important. If you're in a library, this is uh, easier, but it means that you have to commit to this idea. Once I've tried it out, once I've built whatever I'm building, once I've done the research or tried it out, built the project, digitized the collection, whatever, I have an obligation to keep it up. So you're making a commitment with IMLS. Either you, and usually you in the library, or one of your partners, or finding a partner like we did um, with, with ARL. So it is, a, it is a commitment. They don't want any more of this one and done. And that's been a change. And that's been a change in response to their funders. It's, been a, it's a change because the funding agencies, Congress, is, said that we don't want to fund things anymore that people just do, they're just supporting researchers and then nothing happens, which of course I could go on and on about the short-sightedness of that, but I will not. But this idea that again, especially with IMLS, they're a mission-driven organization that is pra practice-based. They want to see museums and libraries continue and, and LIS programs because curriculum, we are committed now to this curriculum. They funded us building curriculum and science information. We can't just say funding's gone, we can't do it anymore. So this has to be a part of it. A sustainability plan has to be a part, especially for IMLS. Um, you have to uh, have a plan to share the information and as well as sustain it. 
um even with national science foundation, our big data one project, building computer infrastructure and a culture of data sharing among earth and environmental scientists. That's a huge thing. It's a 10 year project. What do we have to do in the second five years? We're in year six right now. We have to build sustainability. When NSF funding goes away, how is the infrastructure continued to be maintained? And so that's, that's huge. It has an implication for libraries because, of course, one of the first things says is we make libraries subscribe to it. Yeah. If you're in a library, you'd love to hear that, right? That's a lot of sustainability plans of, of projects for NSF. So, you know, there's a, we've got to be a little careful. Luckily, we have librarians on the, that project, so they know that libraries can't bear the price, the cost of everything. Um, if you digitize something, again, you have to say that once it's digitized, you're going to maintain it. So, so whether it's building something, testing something, building curriculum, digitizing something, whatever you do, whatever your good idea is, you have to say how you're going to commit to it forever. Um, the other thing is that uh, part of this is what you do when they decide that you, from among all the proposals, you're going to get their money. You are committing to being a model to others. You are committing to share your ideas. You're committing to tell people what worked and what didn't work. Um, you are, that may be you know, building a website that has that. It may be giving conference papers. It may be publishing, whatever. It could be uh, giving workshops. It could be lots of different things. But you really are saying, OK, we're going to do this. And it's going to help us. It's going to really help our organization. But I'm going to share how it happened with everybody else. So um, this idea, NSF, that it, you know, research has to be integrated with education. <coughs> so we're going we're gonna to build this, and then we're going to create a class, and that class is going to be <coughs> offered forever. Um, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to continue to do continuing education. So this, this idea with the, um, our engineering department is we're going to build a curriculum that will then be shared with other engineering schools. So um, it won't just be, we won't just develop it and offer it. We'll have to then get the course materials and make them available. Um, and then also, you've got to, um, or finally, you've got to justify you. Why me? Um, justify their investment in you. They are, they are making an investment. So um, the project has to be uh, significant, important. It, it has, you have to tell them what benefits are accrued. If the project is successful, this is going to improve uh, digital literacy in, in um, secondary schools throughout, throughout the Puerto Rico or throughout the nation or you know, whatever, that this is something that, that this is going to help students succeed or this is going to help scholarly communication go to the next level. Okay, something, something that will, will, will uh, um, show that, that what you're doing is going forward. Um, society is going to benefit in, in whatever ways from your project. Um, for Data One, if we have infrastructure and a culture of data sharing, what NSF expects is that the grand challenges of climate science will, some of those questions will be answered or moved, science will move forward because scientists will have access to data gathered by other scientists and be able to use and reuse the data. Science will be improved because by sharing data, scientists have to be very careful of quality control of those data. So these are, you know, society will benefit because um, science will move forward. These are the kinds of things they're looking for. The Sloan Foundation also says that they will fund all, um, things that, it, that nobody else will fund. So if you can get it funded by your government, by other foundations, or by private sector, do it. And Sloan will fund those other things. So they're looking for, you know, that you can say, I already tried to get funding from here and there, and Sloan, Sloan can build funding. The, the project we just finished for Sloan had to do with trust in science information. How do, how do scholars know what information to trust 
if the traditional clues are not there. So for example, I know to trust it because it's published in a peer-reviewed journal that my library subscribes to. Okay, so I know it's trustworthy, or you hope it's trustworthy. Okay. Uh, if it's in a blog, how, what do I use, how do I decide whether it's good or not? So we, we did interviews and focus groups and survey of, you know, what, how do I make a decision of trust in, in a, uh, a blog? So it's kind of, it's, it's just trying to move publication forward and collection development forward and all of those kinds of, and, and social media kinds of issues. Um, but, um, so, so Sloan wanted, wanted to fund that. The, um, there is an interesting site. What's coming around is a handout from, um, it's from a private company. It's called granthelpers.com. What they want to do is they want to sell you, they want to help you write your proposals. So there are organizations that you can pay to help write your proposals. There are lots of them. We have never, we've never used them. This is not an endorsement for this organization. Um, I haven't used them. We don't. We, we do have grant writers on our staff, um, that, but we don't uh, who help help our faculty write grant proposals. But uh, uh, but those are those are internal to us. So we we don't use an external company. But there are lots of these kinds of companies, and you, and you might want to consider it. One time we hired a grant writing consultant because we hadn't done proposals before for the National Institutes of Health, and we had some faculty who were doing health communication work, and so we paid that, that grant consultant help. We didn't get it funded anyway, so there's no guarantee if you hire a, a, a grant writer that your, your project will be funded. So, so again, no endorsement of them, although you might want to consider some funding. But, but I give, give this to you because there is a way to advertise their services. They have a really good blog. And they have a good um, they have a good website that has all sorts of really interesting tips. Like one one blog post was um, what not to say when you call the program officer. Um, it, it it gave tips on the conversation you need to have when you talk to a program officer uh, to try to pitch your idea. I think the number one thing not to say is can you fund this? You don't start start with the money. You start with the idea. But anyway. Um, so one of the things they have, is they have a guide to um, grant proposal writing, and they, and they list these five pillars of support, um, which have to do with some of the things I've been talking about today, that when you're thinking about a grant proposal and when you start to write a proposal, um, the first thing you have to think about is the need. The first pillar is the need. That is, there's got to be a clearly defined problem you start with why things are really bad. You know, what, what is the problem? The problem is maybe that, you know, that, that incoming freshman um, attention span is, is less than it used to be and they're not paying attention or they're not reading full articles or something. You'd have to document that. It's like writing a literature review, you know, you'd have to say, you know, this, that you have to give evidence that that problem is a true problem. But so there, so there is a problem that needs to be solved. In, in, our, in our Mellon Foundation, the problem is that with an increasing number of article pay fees, um, the university is paying uh, more fees and that the humanities faculty are not, don't have grants to cover them. So there is a problem statement. So what's gonna happen in the future if all, our, if all, um, Things change our processing fees, so there, so there needs to be a problem. Problem statement, a very clear statement. Um, the um, st uh, problem statement for some of our at the beginning of our science curriculum is that science agencies need people with information expertise, and we are 
Um, our schools are, we're unable to uh, effectively recruit students who have a science background. We needed help with scholarships to be, and to build the curriculum to, uh, to attract students who have that background. So, so something that, is a, that you can demonstrate um, is a problem. Um, the, the next pillar is uh, funding goals. That is, and we talked about that, it's don't, don't even bother sending a proposal. It might be a really good proposal, but if it goes to the wrong agency, it doesn't matter. It's, it's got to fit within their goals. It's their money, they're gonna decide, so make sure it fits their goals. Sometimes this means changing your idea a little bit to, to better match uh, their goals. Or finding another agency. Um, again, it's gotta be unique. Yours has to stand out. You're, you're uh, one out of, you know, they, they, some of them fund 20%, some of them fund less. You've got to make yours really stand out. Um, the, um, it means that you have to build the case of why me. You have to have some background or expertise in that area or bring in partners who do. Um, it's got to have a, impact is the next pillar. It's got to have, you've got to show that it's really gonna help benefit society or people, et cetera, that there's benefits. And then um, something I didn't talk about, it's gotta have a feasible plan. You've gotta make sure that they feel confident that your team can do this in the time that you suggested. So if you suggest um, a, a one-year project and they feel it ought to be three years, you know, they'll tell you. If you suggest a three-year project and they say, why, why are you wasting so much time? This is a project that could be done quicker, yeah, then they'll let you know. So it has to be, you have to have a timeline, you have to have teams, you have to have people who can do it. And, and again, you can often build in extra staff. Don't be, if the budget allows, we, we almost always now build in a research assistant. And, and it's a great way we usually hire recent graduates of our LIS program. <laughs> it's a good way for them to get to get experience, but uh, you know, short-term money. But it's a way that we make sure that they give confidence to the funding agency that we have people that will be dedicated to this, and we may only be spending 10% of our time on it, but we have somebody who will make sure it will get done. <clears throat> so there's some examples on this handout. I think this one is, um, again, kind of reinforces some of the things I've been saying and I'll leave that with you to, to spend a little more time looking at. The, um, now, you know, some of the things we've been talking about is, is it a research or is it a, is it a project? And the line is increasingly blurry between whether something is research or project. Um, it used to be you think of National Science Foundation and they're just doing basic research and that, that the researchers didn't have to worry about how it was going to be used. It was just you know basic science research that will eventually, perhaps, in the future, um, you know, lead to, I started to say cure for cancer, but that'd be National Institute of Health, right? They don't do medical, but would eventually have some benefit. Um, nowadays, most of the agencies are looking for something that has, that you can demonstrate will have a, have immediate impact. Um, for library and information science, this is usually has not been a problem. We are a practice-based uh, profession. Many of you are practicing librarians, or you and you you may be uh, collaborating uh, with um, others in your university that are doing practical kinds of projects. So we're doing applied research or projects, and many of the funding agencies now will will um, look favorably, do look favorably. On, on those, so uh, that's not really much of a concern anymore. Um, let me move on to um, some typical sources of funding. Um, I've already mentioned some, but just to, to give you, and you've got, you've got these handouts, um, do, do think widely. If you have, I already mentioned NSF and IMLS. Um, if you have a uh, humanities project, there's also a National Endowment for the Humanities, very competitive. Um, humanities projects, you know, can be funded by IMLS and they can be funded by um, by the Mellon Foundation. So um, NEH maybe uh, I would say you have to have some track record with NEH. Hard to get a first one in, um, but you could partner with somebody who does. Faculty member on campus, for example, who maybe does and needs an information component in it. 
um same with the national institute of health hard to break in the first time um and and i haven't broken in the first time submitted proposals but have not um so again partnering with somebody who has broken in um what is the number one uh predictor of success for a grant proposal anybody know prior success the matthew effect right the rich get richer um it's this idea that if you've had success in the past then they have confidence that you and you've done you know you've done a good job they then you they have confidence you can do it again so nothing wrong with partnering with somebody who has had success uh, sometimes sometimes you get lucky on the first try and there's some things for early career people if you really on the first try but but um you know partnering with us and NEH and NIH are particularly difficult um NEH uh, sometimes has digitization projects so both IMLS and NEH fund libraries to digitize historic collections or unique important collections so there those are things if you if that fits you you might look at um and and by the way i say major dollars these are they fund everything from well planning grants are typically at IMLS planning grants are about $30,000 they fund up to multiple million multiple millions so uh IMLS this year has a limit of a million dollars per project um that sounds like a whole lot of money it is a whole lot of money do remember that there are uh, federally negotiated overhead rates and so your university does have an overhead rate so um you, you don't spend all that on your project although you do it directly it comes back to the to the university um for LIS in addition to IMLS and NSF which are the two we've had the most success for um occasional solicitations library of congress does occasional things and preservation has been one of those digitization has been another um not you know it's not a regular thing it's not something you can count on like NSF and IMLS and you know coming out all the time but occasional um and then and then i've mentioned foundations before but don't forget foundations they operate differently so IMLS you know that twice a year they're going to have um solicitations an opening for for call for proposals for libraries and twice a year for museums and they come out approximately the same time although their schedules changed a little bit so you know you can kind of follow and you know that's going to happen. Their priorities change a little bit but it's pretty pretty uh, stable. Um NSF has stuff coming out all the time. By the way, NSF you've got to get on their website. <laughs> Just say okay for the next half day I'm going to spend in that website. See what they funded before, see what they have open. They have many many divisions. And just because it says, you know, a division biological sciences division do not assume you don't fit. What about if you're in a library, what about your biology department? They need information literacy or they need, you know, tools or something. So you, you can fit in those. Um but um but they have regular solicitations that come out all the time. So you can find something. You have to match your idea to their solicitation. Okay? You find a solicitation, you match your idea. you write your idea then you find a solicitation right foundations are a little bit different with foundations you ask them are they interested in your idea so it's a little different you don't respond to a solicitation you you say here's my idea and they'll say no nah, i'm not interested and then you build a really close relationship if they are interested the program officer there helps you write the proposal pretty much and it's individuals at 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 uh, Mellon it's Don Waters who is the guy in scholarly communication in 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 our area and you build a relationship with him and he tells you how to write your proposals so and they'll tell you right up front if they're not interested so it's a kind of a different relationship Sloan it's the same thing it's an individual who is in our area who will say yes or no and help you build so they pre-select pretty pretty carefully at the foundation and the dollars vary um depending on on what uh, what it is but you're not going to be in the multi millions of dollars usually with these um but sometimes you know $5000 can do a lot with your building infrastructure for example 
um other funders don't forget other possibilities sometimes private corporations have foundations elsevier has a foundation engineering information foundation if you have this it's hard to read that on the bottom that says engineering information foundation um one of my first grant proposals was to engineering information foundation in fact they asked afterwards they asked my partner um and me to help them write their um their guidelines for what kind of proposals they would accept which was kind of nice and they're still using those guidelines i noticed so that's that's pretty nice so if you have an engineering information kind of thing they will fund up to twenty five thousand dollars so you know they're in the small range but if you are wanting to build things to help um your engineering faculty or um encourage um one of their ideas is encouraging more women to get into engineering fields maybe it's materials for you, you don't have to be an engineer to get money from engineering information OCLC um, has funds you may notice every year they have this solicitation special libraries association has a foundation so um, it's private corporations uh, and it's others and most of these again are in the the five to twenty five thousand dollar range most of them don't have um overhead attached the money the, the money comes to to you to do whatever you need to be done but they may have limitations of how you can, can spend it. um I've, I've already told you a lot of personal things so i don't want to spend a, a lot of things um yes i've got too many grants right now um part of the problem of having the job i did of helping others write grants is i got lots of interesting ideas and started and couldn't stop myself sometimes but um but it's it, one thing does lead to another and i the reason i put this up here is one thing definitely leads to another so um i've got funding right now from mellon just finished sloan got nsf imls um but the reason I, again indulge me here for my own my, my area of interest is scholarly communication particularly in the stem disciplines and particularly how it intersects with the publishing industry and with libraries and use and users that is how do faculty academic students etc how do they use in the stem disciplines how do they use scholarly information and how can we make that better and how do changes affect them and how do their needs affect changes and all this kind of relationship and so um so all of those projects really have to do with that it's looking at patterns value and outcomes of access to scientific information so even though it seems scattered there actually is a focus there and that's the kind of message that you give to the agencies that these are, you know, these are indeed this relationship is what is what builds. So, um, I talked about two. Be aware of time here. Yes, give me some time. Um, I'm not going to go today to these agencies, but in your handouts, you in your um, the the uh, PowerPoint that was sent to you, you've got uh, uh, the links. Not that you couldn't find these. Uh, but uh, do do look through them and, and see the kinds of things that they are looking for. Remember to follow their missions. Um, again, if it's IMLS, it's libraries and museums. Um, they want innovation. They want learning. They want cultural and civic engagement. You have to build the case that that's what's doing. Okay. And NSF mission as well. Um, hard to see, but. Right here, you can see it. Science, Technology, and Society Division. So for, for NSF, I mentioned that they have a lot of divisions that you might not think. So don't, uh, they have the social sciences. They have science, technology, and society pro program solicitation that comes out every year. Um, it's, it's, um, it's how technology is influencing people. They have behavioral sciences division. And so that's what you do a lot of how does technology and access, how does access to information anywhere, anytime influence learning, for example. These are things that, that fit in very well. Look also for cross-cutting, cross-cutting solicitations, which cut across divisions. So those are good for partnerships. The library, information science people partnering with biology partnering with um, 
um, other kinds of divisions, computer science. Um, they have the Division of Computer and Network Systems. Again, this could be applications. You fit in very well with that if you're building new systems. Um, so all of those, Science, Technology, Society, Computer and Network Systems, uh, Behavioral and Social and Social Science Research, um, Interdisciplinary Behavioral and Social Science Research, IBSS is a division. Um, it fits in absolutely with what we do. They used to also have the National Science Digital Library solicitation, which is where I got my first NSF funding, but that is not uh, around anymore. So find, think of your idea, find the solicitation, then the next thing you do is you contact the program officer. You don't say, will you fund me, but you'll say, here's my great idea, this is fit within your solicitation. And they will say, you know, yes, no, maybe. Send me an abstract, and they'll help you. They won't, they won't, they're not quite the level of help that a foundation is, but at least they'll steer you another way if it's, if it's wrong. They, they won't let you go down the wrong path. IMLS, remember, too, the FIT Library's National Leadership Grants and Laura Bush Librarians, and then if you're in a museum, there are the equivalents for museums. And then they have a lot of all other kind of special, um, they have a special, um, Native American solicitation, they have a special uh, Native Hawaiian, they have a special, uh, they have a few special things, but these are the, these are the main ones. Um, Sloan, um, again, um, they, uh, they did a lot of the early funding for Wikipedia. You might not have known that. <laughs> um, they, they, that wasn't my funding. Um, but so the accuracy, how to make sure that Wikipedia is accurate and organized, and some of those ideas that have been implemented in Wikipedia were funded by Sloan. So they are really into improving scholarly communication in the future. If you have anything about using social media or, or new ways to convey information or transforming the library uh, in virtually, those kinds of things, Sloan might be interested in that. They're, they're real, very much are interested in this, in new media and kind of what is the impact on um, education and, and life. They're really interested in how does that influence people's lives, how does that influence education. So, so don't, don't forget that. Um, again, Mellon, um, very, they really are interested in uh, humanities, liberal arts, if you have performing arts, visual arts, anything here, Mellon, Mellon is interested in, in that. They do uh, digital libraries, they, uh, um, they do education and teaching. Okay, so now I wanna move to tips on proposal writing and we've got another And we'll, we'll come to this, I'll hand it out now, we'll come to it in just a minute. I'm going to give you some overall tips and then we're going to work on, uh, we're going to work on improving. So these are, uh, some of these are ridiculous, but some of them are um, are real. <laughs> I won't tell you which ones are the ridiculous and which ones are the real. Um, on, on, on bad examples and good examples of, of proposal writing. So, so in preface to this, and then we'll, we'll do the rest of the time uh, working in groups, uh, things that immediately, for writing your proposal, things that are gonna knock you out in the beginning is if you miss the deadline. So that's not even a proposal writing. You could, may have a beautiful proposal. If you miss the deadline, you're out. Um, something else that will knock you out is if you miss something that's required. Now, so they say you have to have a data management plan, or they say you have to, if you have a postdoc, you have to have a postdoc mentoring plan, that will knock you out. Unless they really like your idea, then they'll call you back and say, hey, send me this data management plan that isn't here. So that's a caveat, don't leave it out on purpose. But if it's really good otherwise, there is a little bit of leeway there. 
so but but make sure that you have gone through every section and have everything that's included they will knock something out of it's over budget and less they really like it you can see a pattern here right the best deadline doesn't matter if they like it it's gone but over budget if you can cut real fast even if you're within their budget they may ask you to cut so you may propose three hundred thousand dollars and they'll come back to you and say what can you do for two hundred thousand and let me know by tomorrow so be prepared we've had to do this um, and so you have to start cutting really fast so good to have your budget all itemized beforehand so you can you can cut quickly some you can say I can't do it forget it I withdraw it. that's all right too um, or you can you can cut you can you were going to develop three learning modules and you've got it down to two or something um, but some and the other thing that'll knock it out before it may not knock it out right at the beginning but it will certainly knock it out at the peer review stage because most proposals go to peer reviewers the foundations don't always do peer reviewers sometimes they just decide but they help you write remember but for for something uh, government agency if it is confusing imprecise or just plain boring you're not going to get very far has to be interesting this is a sales job as well as a good idea we're not used to that okay most of us are not so think you've got you have a good idea but you've got to sell it and and so if it's dull you won't get it so so this is an example from a from a website um, of what they call imprecise writing. This is for her humanities. This is not one of mine. So I plan to do a feature film starring, should be starring, not staring, starring people, so there's a typo in there too, starring people I meet on the streets in all the neighborhoods of Chicago. This piece will be about how we can all live on this planet. Okay. It's pretty imprecise. It's a problem statement. You don't expect everything to be there, but this is an example of something that was turned in it's not you don't know okay a feature film that's pretty broad and their their example of how to improve this in just one sentence is make it more precise i plan to create a triptych of three 10-minute films so they give up they give a length they get precise which will rework the same narrative using three different sets of actors in three different locations in chicago in this work, I will question ways that we view conflict with regards to ethnicity and urban location. It's the same proposal. This one doesn't tell, doesn't sell, doesn't give me the reader um, uh, confidence that they really know what they're doing. Whereas this one, I, I'm confident that they've thought it out. They know what they're doing. Now, of course, there has to be a work plan. There has to be a budget and everything else. But this is an example of that. They also have to catch the reader's eye immediately. Has anybody over here reviewed proposals for like NSF or IMLS? How many did you review at a time? Do you remember? They used 10. Ten? They were submitted to 35. Yeah. So somebody started with a pile of 35, and then they got to cut it to 10, and then they cut it to That's a lot of reading in a short time. And if you if you don't catch the reader's interest right away, you know you, you've con they may continue through conscientious reviewers continue through, but it, they you know there's a bias against you right at the beginning, like oh my gosh, when are they going to finish? So a catchy title that's relevant to the project is is a good idea. Uh, you can get you can you can carry this a little for too far <laughs> but um you know don't be afraid to use acronyms or puns like do the right thing on a re how to improve reading writing um, data one stands for data observation network for earth and we were the first one in the data net series so you know we kind of we're saying okay data one and the and the one actually i should have shown you the one is actually a globe it's actually the earth so it looks pretty as well. Um, science Links was our first science one, linking science practitioners to information science. 
students, so there was this idea of science link. so something that's catchy, memorable will stick with the reader's mind, will stick with your mind, so when you do it are always a good idea for a for a proposal title. i said don't go overdo it. we we did have a proposal that was submitted that was an acronym twelve twelve letter acronym and it came out to angel picks me it was and it was so convoluted about trying to get at what was an a word and what was an n word and what was a g word i don't even remember so that was too that was too complicated because i don't i don't even remember it um so so it needs to be catchy short and, and something that people will remember and again it's sort of a gimmick but it also is a is a help help to plant something in people's minds um, a little more substantive, it needs to be outcome-based. You need to tell people what the outcomes will be as a result of this project. Um, one of our faculty members has, has um, done two IMLS grants for uh, rural librarians, librarians in rural areas of Appalachia. And, and he has um, outcomes-based, he has talked about how many more librarians will be uh, certified, uh, qualified to serve in rural areas. So he's got a number, it will educate this number, and then how many communities they will reach with library services that, that, that allows them to have library services that were limited before. So there is an outcomes of, not only of the educational outcomes of the people who are educated, but of the people they serve. So there, are, there is a two-stage outcomes, if you will. Um, the budget needs to be realistic. If they say, you know, it can be up to a million dollars, that does not mean your project needs to be a million dollars or 999,999. Make it realistic. If you think about this, 10 proposals and everyone's a million, but they don't have $10 million to spend. So if yours is only 87,000, then that looks pretty way. I can, I can get more proposals funded for this limited, so you know, make it realistic. Um, and the other thing is you don't wanna make it a million is because some of them require cost sharing. And so for IMLS, if you are spending a million, they may require a one-to-one -one cost share, which means you have to come up with a million dollars of your own, okay? So it doesn't always, more isn't always better, okay? Um, it's gotta be doable, don't overpromise. Um, you know, cut it back. If you said you were gonna do 10 learning objects, do you really need 10? Can you do that in two years, or however long your project is? Maybe you need to only do three, or something. Make it make it something that that is reasonable, uh, passionate but reasonable. And again, um, I mentioned before that they have to be um, collaborative. Um, you, most now require you working with somebody else. Very few will, will allow a single person, um, and and then sustainable as well. You've got you've got to build in sustainability. Okay. So um, what I handed out to you was um, uh, some examples of, of poor writing. I want to um, uh, have you. Take, oh gosh, we're almost out of time, so here, five minutes to fix it. Um, I was hoping that we'd have, we'd have some time for you to work on your own proposal. So if you have a proposal here that you'd like to look at, may I suggest that you look at your first paragraph. Is it selling? Is it passionate? Can you make it better? So you can do that if you have something that you're working on. If not, if you don't have something that you're working on, now, you can take this example for, for five minutes and you'll see in that where I say make this better. So you can work with the people with you and see if you can fix some of these. Some of them are kind of vague, so you have to kind of add your imagination of what this might be about and see if, see if you can fix them. So we'll do, do five minutes and then we'll reconvene. So sorry for taking The first one to be fixed, by the way, if you can't figure out my logic here, would be the slide number five, which 
refers to the weak problem statement, the roles of librarians and libraries are being questioned. That's a bad example.
I know you barely got started. <laughs> and I'd be glad to stay afterwards, but I am also aware that some of you do need to leave on at, at 11. So we'll, we'll end and then, as I say, I can, I can stay around a little bit. Is anybody, anybody brave enough to share their rewrite? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wrote, in the past decade, libraries have had a significant impact on their users. Uh, for example, helping them um, maintain and help them write about learning. The university library is an integral part of society. They're committed to helping their graduate students acquire 21st century digital literacy skills to better do their jobs uh, when entering the workplace. In order to continue doing this, Very good. Anybody else? You know, the only edit on that I would make is I might even take that last sentence out about the funds. I might not even explicitly state that. I might, I might say better tell their story or improve education or you know something like that. And I know it, it, I'm not trying to you know to skirt the issue, but but somehow you know the, the point is improving. Um, I. If it were public libraries, I might have, have, have done something like um, emphasized the um, uh, something like while today's um, society is considered a digital society, over a million or whatever the number is, a million people do not have adequate access to the internet or computers. Uh, public libraries can help bridge this digital divide through increasing their services and you know and kind of go on from there. So there's it's a problem as you say that it's a it's a solution and and uh, something that will, rather than just give me money uh, because I'm good or I need it. Um, I do want to one other thing is I do, the very last on page two the little the little one that's at the pop up here. Um, one of my books, I mean, this is kind of silly. This is just, just grammar and spelling. But I, I, the really bad example here, uh, Carol Tenefer will be the principal investigator on this grant. Oh my god, do you know how many times I have, even my research staff has written a proposal where they say principal, P-L-E, instead of principal, P-A-L. A principal PLE investigator is the ethics police, <laughs> not the PI of a project. So this was a real example of a proposal that I hope I caught before it went. Okay, so spelling, do, do make sure that the spelling and grammar is checked. And then there's lots of grammar mistakes in that statement, including I had my, my um, UK, my, my British English spelling check on instead of my American English spelling check on. So, um, so anyway, so again, I'd be we do. I am aware of time, but we I'd be glad to, to work with you and talk with you afterwards. Let me let me just finish with a couple of concluding remarks. Is that um, again, grant proposal writing takes time. We don't want to minimize that. It'll take time to put your teams together. It takes time to write. We tell our faculty if you can start preparing a year in advance for the big ones. Um, smaller ones, not so much. Hardly anybody does. Uh, six months, maybe, but it's not something that you want to do in just a week. Um, it requires perseverance. I, at first, I had this as a thick skin. You, I mentioned before, you, you're not likely to get funded the first time, but you will get, for most agencies, you'll get really good comments. And the comments usually will help you improve it. So uh, decide if you want to submit, but, but when you submit something, expect that you will re revise and resubmit. And talk to the program officers. Uh, you know, find out if, it, if it's worth resubmitting. Uh, they are very glad to talk to you. You can call them or you can email them or both. Or go to see them at conferences if it's IMLS especially. It does require support from your institution. If your institution doesn't care, um, or doesn't help you, then you're in trouble. But on the other side is, it's not only support, there are also requirements. And I haven't talked at all about requirements from your institution. Most of you are not eligible to submit a grant proposal as an employee of an institution. It has to go through your office of research. They are the only ones that are allowed to for most of these. So you've got to find out who it is and make good friends with those people. And if the due date 
is next week, their due date probably was last week. So they have to have some time to review it. So they'll help you, they're there to help you, but also to submit. Mm -hmm. So you have to have, whether you want it or not, you have to have it. Um, and again, you do need to contact the granting agencies. Um, don't forget, don't propose something you don't want to do. Um, you got to do it. And if you ever want to get funding from them again, you want to be as close to on time as possible. Um, they also, they, it's not just doing it and being done. They usually have reporting requirements. IMLS has recently uh, cut down the number of reports, which is nice. They used to be uh, quarterly, then it was twice a year. Now it's, it's once a year, pretty much, for most. Um, and again, your organization, they might do your budget for you. They certainly will want to look at their bu your budget and revise it. They have to put in overhead rates. They have to question things. Um, and, and again, in your budget, make sure you put in things like conferences. Uh, they will. They do want you to go to conferences. They want you to spend the word. Uh, and I don't mean you giving them. I, I mean you, workshops, yes, that you present, but also just you attending and, and telling about your project. And, and then the final word, um, it's an opportunity to do things, make collaborations, do things that are interesting, get you into new areas, and it should be fun. If it's something you really don't want to do, then maybe you need to rethink it. Maybe it's perhaps <laughs> not the best idea for you to do, or pass the idea on to someone else. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Si tienen alguna pregunta, pueden hacerla ahora. Eh, la doctora tengo un grupo de 